The following program contains adult content and language. Viewer discretion is advised. The Tenderloin, the densely populated downtown community of San Francisco, famous for its music background and historic buildings and theaters, infamous for its widespread drug use, crime, and homelessness. It's also one of the neighborhoods with the highest number of people living with HIV. Within this neighborhood, people are using strength and courage to try to live their lives. I've come here to meet with members of Rising Blackness. It's a group that engages a community with some pretty straight talk about how to prevent new infections of HIV. We'll also hear some incredible tales of resiliency. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Vicki. Hi, Gavin. Thank you so much. 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 Hi, Gav
you know, because I didn't know what to expect, didn't know the neighborhood. And within a block, I would be propositioned maybe five or six times to participate in some type of legal activity or someone trying to, to serve me drugs. Well, when, when, you know, drugs are in your face every day and you're stepping over it and, 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 and you know, all the temptations are there, I mean, how do you survive every day? Well, you basically have to kind of stay focused and have a, a, a plan as far as um, things that you normally do in the course of your everyday life, you know, and as long as you have a goals that you set for yourself, this allows you to kind of um, have a, a plan that you work through and kind of stay um, beyond all the negativity that you run into on a daily basis. So you share your experiences with each other mm -hmm. and tell me a little bit about what brought you to this group. Well, as a health educator, um, and I have an affiliation with quite a few different agencies throughout the city, uh, Black Brothers Esteem, um, Rising Blackness. I also have uh, my own group, LGTB group, called The Family at the Harden Hotel, which I facilitate. Um, it allows me a chance to network with my brothers and for us to support each other in our um, challenges as well as our triumphs and our victories, you know. I mean, obviously, you're, you're very independent uh, you're very different from one another but you have certain shared experiences and so so when you you tell those stories how, how does it impact you I, will is nodding so. <laughs> well uh, it it helps me uh, realize who I really am and get back give back to the community and help me find the enemy to move forward and you know, especially you want a person that's coming out of addiction and yeah. dealing with, um, you know, my real things and my real drama. So, but who's the real enemy? Is it inside or outside? Well, um, as a person living with HIV, you know, I'm affected and I'm infected living here in the Tenderloin. And I'm here today to let everyone out there know that um, we have hundreds of good people in the Tenderloin. Everyone is not a bad person. I mean, we have um, single mothers that are struggling. We have single parents, single fathers that are struggling. Um, you know, um, and it's not a death sentence. There's no shame in my HIV, you know. My name is Miss Billy Cooper, and I'm a transgender woman living with HIV. I came to San Francisco in 1980 the gay mecca of the world back then. When I first got here, um, I met someone named Miss Major. And I went to her one day and I said, Miss Major, who am I, what am I? She said, you're a woman child, <laughs> get used to it. And ever since then, I've been transgender. Well, I was transgender before that, but I just didn't know it. I was diagnosed in 1985 here in San Francisco. And it was devastating at the time. It really affected me. After it started sinking in, um, I was deep in my addiction at the time. I was using, I was off the hook, I was reckless, and I was having um, unsafe sex back then, and I didn't care about myself or other people. Throughout my whole addiction, you know, people were always there for me, always there. It was just that I wasn't here for myself, so. It was just like Dorothy clicking those shoes. She's all, she always had it with her and always had it with me. It was, just, uh, it was just bringing it to the surface and, you know, realizing that I had it. You know, I had it in, inside me to do it. I'm um, with Rising Blackness to, um, to reach out to all my transgender si brothers and sisters, especially sisters who um, don't realize at the time that um, they have options, they have choices, and, you know, their opinion matters to be that shining beacon to be that light in the horizon. My life has totally turned around and I, I care about all my sexual partners and I don't practice anything but safe sex, the safest sex. You know, it's great to be alive today because I'm living today, I'm not just existing, I'm living today. I have a purpose for being here. Just pay it forward, just pass it, pass it on, you know. Well, the safe sex message has been out there for a while, 
and it isn't always making its way through. What, why, what, what happens? What are you trying to do to counter that? Well, you know, I, you know, working with people that's HIV positive, learning the things they go through, the things that I don't want to go through mm -hmm. as an HIV negative person. And the challenge is people that's living with addiction, and most people have survival sex around here. You said survival sex? What, what, is, what is that? Well, a person that comes from out of town or somebody that's coming through and don't have money to, for a place to stay, oh. and sometimes they might not get paid for it in exchange for sex, it's either drugs or, or a roof over their head. Okay. Uh -huh. Now, Miss Billy, you said that you are HIV positive. Anyone else here? Hi, I'm, I'm Edmund Juice. I've been positive since 91 year before Magic Johnson. And I, uh, when I got here, you know, we had the Brothers Network and we had uh, negative people and positive people working. So my perspective as a lone survivor, I see HIV, if you are, get tested earlier, you can uh, live longer, be healthier, but it's, the ignorance and the stigmas that go with HIV probably. Does HIV positive, does that define you as a person? No, it doesn't. You know, sometimes I don't even think I'm positive because I think I have other challenges and barriers that I'm dealing with and I'm in good health. You know, I think behavior change was important for me and I live in this long, you know, and healthy when I've seen a lot of friends who have passed. Because if you look at me and probably Billy, we don't have a lot of people around from the past. And we sometimes you wonder why I'm still here, you know. Being in this oppressed area, and especially being a black man in this area, you got so many other issues that you're worried about until condoms is not a priority. You, you got to deal with surviving, with eating, housing. Housing situation is just terrible. And you know, um, just even finding a job, can't find a job. Mm -hmm. and, cause, and some of these people have families and kids. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and health, we got major health issues with high blood, blood pressure, diabetes, you know. STDs. And, <laughs> that included too, <laughs> you know. You know, I, I don't want to over-dramatize this, but it seems that each one of them really is kind of life or death. I mean, they're... they're but uh, Vicki, but really, the same things and the same trauma and the same normal, um, the same discrepancies that are in the Tenderloin are in every neighborhood out there. People zero in on the Tenderloin mm -hmm. because it's the Tenderloin. Sure. It's a, the Tenderloin has such a bad reputation. Sure. But maybe right. it's just more concentrated? That's yes, more That's concentrated. People come from all over the world to visit here because they know whatever their sexual fantasy is, mm -hmm. whatever their drug fantasy is, could be fulfilled in the Tenderloin. And once they leave the Tenderloin, it's still in the Tenderloin. It's not going outside because I ran into a lot of big wigs in the Tenderloin. Huh? And there's a lot of activity <laughs> here all the time. So th this place don't sleep. Okay. I okay. mean, it's activity here. Yeah, well, we're not naming names. Like no, 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 I'm not getting sued. <laughs> Vicki, I would like to say that I, we're in a TL, but it's, we're in San Francisco, so everyone come to San Francisco where the citizens of other countries, the world number one tourist destination. So mm -hmm. that means that the TL is in San Francisco, and it's the one that everyone say, well, the hotels are undesirable. Well, so. how is it different than, say, the Castro? I mean, whoa. Whoa. I, whoa. <laughs> whoa. It, it's, I would say it's the difference between night and day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Castro's kind of the, the white gay um, subculture, and mm -hmm. the TL is the TL. But why do people keep getting infected? The safe sex because, message is out there. But there are so, everyone has their own challenges to deal with. And only you can keep yourself safe. It's important you know, to know that just in HIV in general, we have like one in four p people in San Francisco, in the country, have no idea they're infected with HIV. So, so something that may have happened a year or so ago, um, but we know that one out of four people do not know they're infected. But here so, in San Francisco, we have 15 to 20 new infections each and every week. And I do yeah. think that the safer sex messages happen, but I think that because people have competing priorities, 
um, that it is mm -hmm. hard to sustain that message. And also our religion background, people yeah. that's married and have a, a girlfriend and they believe, um, like coming from the South, I was taught long as you uh, live within the guideline of right. a woman and so a man. So you're doing it on the download. You doing you're, it you're in well, denial. You in denial or we denial with your sexuality. Long as you sleep with a woman and you consider yourself heterosexual, no way you have HIV. Don't they don't know that every HIV is an equal employment disease. It applies to everybody, and at the same time, uh, people, you know, th you know, don't get the message. My name is Will and I'm HIV negative. I became a bartender at 19 years old. I was living a heterosexual life with a girlfriend and, you know, and was raising a child and I had to do like nine months in jail and that's when I was mainly introduced to homosexuality and people just don't know what goes on behind them jail walls. I became an addict from jail. I feel that my life was a total waste and a disaster because the drugs was taking a total on my life, so I came to visit San Francisco, and my friends that lived in San Francisco was living fabulous in San Francisco, and I thought, well, I need to move to San Francisco to get away from these narcotics and the drama, and I came here, it was just like open season. One day I decided to use it at another sex party, and a guy showed up and told me, um, thought I was broke, so thought, told me, well, if you want to get high, if you really want to get high, you you have to let me uh, ejaculate inside of you. And I was, I, I, first I was like, is this serious before I respond? And I'm like, oh my God, I, my, my mind was racing. I said, Could, I can't believe he making me make a life a threatening a decision like this. I, I just left, I grabbed my clothes, I went upstairs before I responded. Went back to my apartment and I thought about it and I um, kind of broke down. Like, I can't believe this. And I came back and told him how I really felt about this and, and what the consequences are once you do stuff like this. And, Rags and Blackness has the opportunity for me to shine. We teach people to take responsibility of their own health, even if they're positive or negative. I plan on working with people that's living with AIDS or HIV or cancer and uh, in a dietitian department. I want to cook food with love. I want to cook, uh, you know, nice cuisines. I love bacon and pastry. I want to make people happy. I want to work in hospice and bring life to the situation through the love of cooking. the rogue person out there that is knowingly infecting. Uh, do you know anybody out there? Well, is it generally understood who? You've heard uh, back in the day since there, it's because you're HIV, sometimes because you're HIV positive, you have to get subsidies. And with hard economic times, sometimes there's a philosophy. I can't find any housing, I can't find a job. I'm down on my luck, but my neighbor next door is HIV positive. He's got all the subsidies. He's living out a higher quality of life I want to part of that life. So Sometimes, you're saying being HIV negative is actually tougher to sustain? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it is. Sometimes look for, people look for a way out of easy street and they think, yeah, I've tried everything else, let me go ahead and get, get infected. I mean, I know it's a sick kind of mind way of thinking, but some people feel that's the way to sustain. Well, if you think that HIV positive people are given preferential treatment and you're hungry, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, sure. And since it's not a death sentence anymore, people feel like they can take the risk. That's the degree of the oppression. Mm. To if people are oppressed so bad in order to survive, they would rather be infected mm. so they can stop eating in the food line. Mm. But, but so they can stop sleeping under a bridge. As but, an HIV positive person, I feel that a lot of people just play the Russian roulette with uh, becoming positive because, you know, we are here, some of us have lived and we're here, but I think we are not often used to uh, educate and share our stories. So, Edmund, do you feel you're just lucky? Uh, no, I feel, I always knew when I read an Ebony magazine back in the 80s that if I got HIV positive, I would still love. I always had these concepts of faith, and I said, if I get it, God is going to help me. I always had that. So that's my. I, I look at it like this from an educated point of view, you know, like a fireman. 
if a person's stuck in an elevator during a fire and there's people's, 20 people in this room, they got to say, they got to have to pass that one first. It's the more lives you say, it's, that's how the medication works. So, so I'm hearing a lot of stuff that, you know, obviously, because the, the group is, is black men, uh, transgender. transgender, sorry, same gender, uh, loving. Same gender loving, gay. Uh, it's an umbrella for you know a lot of things, but basically, for, for for people that are listening to this and and want to glean something from it, uh, are there messages that really kind of transcend this group? Oh yeah, uh, I think if you look at the group, one of the things that we have focused on is our resiliency. That you know whether we are positive or we are negative. Um, that we are here um, and we were able to make contributions. You know, Rising Blackness in the last year had nine events um, from safer sex parties to health fairs and the, the group of people at this, at this um, table or in this circle um, outreach in the community, they made their presence known and you had out gays and transgenders who were saying, we are you know, a part of this community and we are supporting the community. It really has been a remarkable work. We all know that when we're alone, facing struggles, and if our health is one of them, certainly it's, it's difficult. Do you, do you derive a certain amount of strength from being able to share you know, your struggles, your pain, and then? Well, I do because um, the issues in uh, my life right now, um, the struggles I'm going through and have already went through, um, the knowledge I have gained and given back to my community, to my, not only my transgender sisters and brothers, but to everyone, you know. You don't have to live in the Tenderloin to receive my message. You don't, you know. You can live in Castro, you know. Um, you can live anywhere. You can live in another city or state. But it's, it's all about, you know, that I'm clean and sober today and I'm a much better person and I have options and I have choices today. One of the things that was um, we focused on from the beginning, and in every event, we allow people to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we came up when we were looking at Rising Blackness is that people don't hear the stories of black folks in San Francisco. For one of our mission statements is that we promote understanding through embracing diversity. And there's probably someone sitting out there right now, probably a young black man, who's probably unsure about his sexuality and about, it's probably unsure about who he is. And if there's a, a message that I want to send to him, it's probably that it's okay to be who you are. Mm. It's okay to, to, to live your life and not to live it as a lie. You know, only, only through living it as a truth will you find some, some realness in, in your destiny. Sexual activities were nothing like it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Now they kill you. Yeah. Mm. A shop won't take care of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you have a reason to live. You are somebody. My name is Emma Ray Knowles and I'm HIV negative. I really don't identify myself as being gay. I identify as being bisexual. Okay, you know, I might be progressing towards that way, but that's actually how I, I identified. And um, when I got here, I was so scared of HIV and being in San Francisco. And um, at first I knew it was HIV headquarters, HIV capital. And I was, it took me about a year and a half before I actually experienced having sex with anyone, just straight out of fear. My friends I grew up with in the country, I can count four of them out of six have died from HIV. One of them died in LA on my couch, in my living room. He was my cousin and my best friend. So it have really touched me in powerful ways. And that is one reason why I'm involved in this. I'm hopeful because I believe change can happen. I just believe we got to start somewhere. And I believe, I believe in what rising blackness doing. That bring a great, a great deal of hope. And I'm hoping that there'll be other groups like us and, I, and, and in different communities. And I got hope that we can impact 
the tenderloin, giving the chance. And I believe we are making a difference because they see us and see the examples that we are setting. Everybody can't come out like everybody because of family values or whatever. It's just a point about respecting the other partner. Always use a condom and respect yourself because other things out there other than STD, herpes is still out there and condoms do not protect you from your herpes. It's just like I, I tell everybody to use their five senses, look, smell. Yep. Okay, if it's not uh, uh, looking good and smelling good, don't put your mouth on it. And, okay, okay, I look at how much money they have, how much drugs they have to come, you know, or, you know, and listen, and listen to what they're saying because it's been people that have been positive that was with me and then uh, they say they negative, but I'm listening to where they go, the people they hang around, mm -hmm. all the HIV environments. Can I ask you, I mean, is there a different messaging? And Gavin, maybe you can answer this. Um, that to the to the community here in the Tenderloin, to you know the black community, is it is that AIDS HIV message different than it would be to say Latino community or any anybody else? The basics of how people stay negative um, and people who are positive stay healthy are the same. But I think what has worked is when you build in some of the references, the cultural references into that prevention message. Mm -hmm. No one wants to, I mean, many people have said they don't want to hear exclusively about HIV. So the events that Rising Blackness did, we did a prayer breakfast and then had an HIV message. We had a health fair and part of that was an HIV message. We had a march and part of that was an HIV message. But we called upon, um, Stefan has um, led in the calling of the spirits. And so we call upon our kind of collective things that you know, are unique to African American culture to get that message there. And people will come in for uh, Papa Ray's and Stefan's food. I mean, that is, you know, mm -hmm. giving in the food, right. they're just you know, here, yeah. they'll yeah. come in. And so they'll get that message so there. So it's that one-on-one -on -one that, that's important I think to it's the one, one, it's also the community. Just watching some but it's also embracing video the community. Or a book. There, no, I think that one of the messages that's, that resonates is I always tell people if you are HIV negative today, there is absolutely no reason for you to become infected. That doesn't mean that staying negative is easy, but there is no reason to stay infected. And we do have high rates of HIV in our communities, anywhere from a third um, to 46% of men who have sex with men uh, have been found to be HIV positive. But I also have turned that around to say, but that also means the majority of us are HIV negative. And so we need, we need new strategies for help, to help us stay negative. But, but the majority of us um, are doing that, and let's try to build upon some of the success stories of keeping people mm -hmm. negative. Thank you all for sharing your stories and Thank intimate you. details of your lives, and I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. And so, after hearing deeply personal stories from people we might otherwise pass by on the street, people like Papa Ray, Steven, and Edmund, who've shared their weaknesses and their strengths, their folly, and their hard-earned wisdom. Time to say goodbye to those who return to their daily lives in San Francisco's Tenderloin, one by one living with the reality of HIV, teaching how to prevent it, survive it, and celebrate life. <laughs>